happen for you all here? We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Do you guys know the routine every year? Hold an evening prayer service format. No Ashley tonight. You will get a message. But it's a good one. I promise. It's a good one. Did you say no message? No, there is a message. Yeah, no, back down. Sit back down. <laughs> None of this woo woo. Yeah, you do have a message. But it's a good one. It is a good one. All right, let's go. No announcements for tonight. Other than that, it looks like we do have church this Sunday, so that's a good thing. We'll pray for that. All right, Gail, here we go. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is It's almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people here. Joy is
still got her done. May our prayers come before you, O oh God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that, in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Your turn off. During our Lent Wednesdays, I'm going to take our Old Testament readings for the following Sunday, and, and I'm going to show you how we can take those verses of old and show you how they can still help us in our hearts and minds to prepare them for the time of Lent we have today. Our first lesson from the Old Testament for this Sunday coming up is from Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 8 through 15. Let's take a look at what the prophet Jeremiah has to say about repentance and obedience. But when Jeremiah had finished his message, saying everything the Lord had told him to say, the priests and prophets and all the people at the temple mobbed him. Kill him, they shouted. What right do you have to prophesy in the Lord's name that this temple will be destroyed like Shiloh? What do you mean saying that the Jerusalem will be destroyed and left with no inhabitants? And the people threatened him as he stood in front of the temple. When the officials of Judah heard what was happening, they rushed over from the palace and sat down at the new gate of the temple to hold court. The priests and prophets presented their accusations to the officials and the people. This man should die, they said. You have heard with your own ears what a traitor he is, for he has prophesied against this city. Then Jeremiah spoke to the officials and the people in his own defense. The Lord sent me to prophesy against the temple and this city, he said. The Lord gave me every word that I have spoken. But if you stop your sinning and begin to obey the Lord your God, he will change his mind about this disaster that he has announced against you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me as you think best. But if you kill me, rest assured that you will be killing an innocent man. The responsibility for such a deed will lie on you, on this city, and on every person living in it. For it is absolutely true that the Lord sent me to speak every word you have heard. There's a reason they called him Jeremiah the Weeping Prophet. And they weren't ready for change, just like this world isn't ready for change a lot. Because we live in a world that is constantly changing. And there are many people who think that, that the world is changing a little too quickly and a little too much. So today in our scripture text, we are reminded that no matter how the world is changing around us, God's word still does not change. God's holy word still teaches us about the law that, that shows us our sin. And it teaches us about the gospel, which reveals to us our Savior and our deliverance from sin. So we can rejoice in the fact that God's word does not change. And as believers, we are given the privilege in, in knowing that, that whatever God's word says is still true today. We hop up to the New Testament here in the first book of Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 13. The scripture passage confirms this truth by saying this, Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, 
which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. So we are thankful. We're thankful that, that God's word remains the same. And we are thankful that that is, is not a word of people. It is the word of God. And we're thankful that, that God's word is continuing to work in each one of us. So let's take a look at how these verses from Jeremiah can show us how the Old Testament law points towards the need of a New Testament gospel. The first point we need to remember is that God's law convicts. Now, Jeremiah was a major prophet in the Old Testament, and he was sent to give a wake-up call to God's people. At this time, the children of Israel were falling far away from the Lord, and they began to worship false gods. So the Lord sent Jeremiah a message of conviction from God's law so as to bring his wayward people to realize their need for repentance. Things were going so bad spiritually that God's message through his prophet Jeremiah was actually one of an impending destruction for those of his people who would not repent of the wrong lives they were living. The Bible even tells us the reaction from the people of Jerusalem after hearing God's message through Jeremiah. Take a look again at verses 8 through 9. But when Jeremiah had finished his message, saying everything the Lord had told him to say, the priests and prophets and all the people at the temple mocked him and said, Kill him, they shouted. What right do you have to prophesy in the Lord's name that this temple will be destroyed like Shiloh? What do you mean saying that Jerusalem will be destroyed and left with no inhabitants? Oof. The people were raging against Jeremiah because they believed that they were children of Israel and God's chosen people. Therefore, they were exempt from any kind of punishment from God. Jeremiah's message from God to the people of Jerusalem was that because of their unrepentant sinfulness, destruction and disaster was definitely coming to their city. Regardless of their, of their rejection of God, because of, I mean, because of their rejection of God, God would reject them. And regardless of whether they were God's chosen people or not. So Jeremiah says to all of the officials and people of Jerusalem in verse 12, The Lord sent me to prophesy against the temple in this city. The Lord gave me every word that I have spoken. Jeremiah was saying this, Hey, it's not me bringing the conviction against you. This is from God himself saying that all of you have fallen way short of God's glorious standard. And because of the people's unwillingness to acknowledge and, and repent of their sinfulness for not respecting and adhering to God's law, the hammer of God was going to come down on them. Now, here's the reality for us, folks. The truth is, God's message of the law hasn't changed. As we comprehend the holiness of God, we see our imperfection and ungodliness. The law still convicts us of our evil thoughts, our wicked words, our sinful actions, time and time again. And that hasn't changed. And we need to remember those words from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. We know that the law applies to those to whom it was given. 
for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. The law convicts us and reminds us that we are sinners. And the law only has the ability to bring conviction, not salvation. Galatians chapter 3 explains this truth starting in verse 10. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. Then, then the Bible tells us how this sin curse is lifted in the very next couple verses. Take a look at verse 13 from Galatians chapter 3. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he <coughs> took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. But the world has a problem with this truth. The world thinks, eh, I'm doing mostly good things in my life, and, I, and I'm trying my best. <coughs> so that should be good enough for God to let me into heaven. The reality, the reality is, however, that if a person thinks that just trying and being good in their life is their golden ticket to heaven, when they die, God will be telling them just as was stated in Luke chapter 13, verses 27 through 28. I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For you will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you will be thrown out. The law convicts. However, it does not save. And that's the message the prophet Jeremiah was telling the people of Jerusalem. The words of the law convicted and stung them right where it hurts. Yet still, God was willing to forgive. However, they needed to go through their Lent first before they could experience an Easter Sunday. And Jeremiah realized that. So Jeremiah tells them in verse 13, But if you stop your sinning and begin to obey the Lord your God, he will change his mind about this disaster that he has announced against you. Jeremiah was telling the people of Jerusalem that they needed to change their hearts so that God could change their lives. And just as God gave the prophet Jeremiah that message to give his people then, God is giving people today the same message. People today are also need to know about the conviction of sin from God's law that, that tells them that they're going the wrong way in their life. And when they realize that they're going the wrong way, they then need to admit and accept that they are going the wrong way and they need help outside of themselves to get them going in the right direction. Nope, it's definitely not pleasant to hear the law. However, we, we need to hear the law. Because the law convicts us of our sin. And realize that, that we can't stand on our own before a holy God. And until people understand this conviction from the law, they can't appreciate the gospel. People have to be able to see that, that they cannot help themselves and they can't save themselves. Only God can bring people 
from under the curse of sin. And when people admit and accept that God's law is convicting them of their sins, then their hearts will be ready for God's gospel, which will console. After Jeremiah gave the people of Jerusalem God's message, Peter gave the same message to the people of Jerusalem 2,600 years later when he proclaims in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Now, Repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. That's God's law bringing conviction. Peter then turns to the people of Jerusalem and says this in Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And that's God's gospel, bringing the consoling power of salvation. And that's why we do Lent. Because to really know the consoling power of Easter Sunday, we have to experience the conviction of sin through Lent. And that the only way we're going to get from conviction to consoling is through God's grace. The, the Latin words are sola gratia, grace alone. And God's grace is perfectly displayed during Lent, especially that last week of Lent, when we celebrate Monday, Thursday, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. It's not a golden ticket of being good enough that will get us into heaven. Because God's law convicts us of the reality we definitely are not good enough. The truth of sola gratia is proclaimed by Jesus himself. And if we look at the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Folks, Lent, Lent is all about the truth, that, that we need both God's conviction of the law and God's consoling through the gospel. And the Bible confirms this truth in the second book of Timothy, chapter 1. If you take a look at verses 9 through 10, the Bible says this, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now, he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. The good news of, of God's consoling gospel is that, that it heals us and it lifts us up and then changes our lives by changing our hearts. The prophet Jeremiah told the people of Jerusalem that they needed to stop their sinning and obey the Lord. And that's the same message given to all of us today. Oh yeah, the world does not want to hear any message of conviction today, just like it didn't want to hear it back when Jeremiah gave the message. However, the reality and truth is that God's word 
is still God's word. The Bible points out our sinfulness. The Bible also points us as to where our forgiveness can come from. And when we see our sinfulness, we can realize the joy of our forgiveness. You and I are the Jeremiah's of today. <coughs> you and I are the voices calling out to the wilderness, to a culture that doesn't want to hear God's message of conviction and consoling. I'm going to close this evening with a message God has for us through his holy word. From the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Scripture says this, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the consoling truth about the good news of the gospel that's through your Son, Jesus. Lord God, as much as the law can give us pain, we also thank you for your law. Because without it, we would never fully appreciate the awesome and wondrous gift of grace that you offer everyone who believes in what your Son, Jesus, accomplished on the cross as the propitiation for our sins. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be the ambassadors of Christ that you have called each of us to be to bring that message of light to this very dark world. And it is through the holy name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Let us pray now for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father God, as we enter into farther into our Lent season here, Lord, the conviction hurts, but we need it, Lord. Because it's through the pain that we're going to appreciate the healing. And the only way that healing is come is through your son, Jesus. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, as we go up those front doors in our mission field to spread that word of truth and conviction and the consoling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our prayer. Lord God, we pray especially for all those uh, uh, missionaries who, who are going out behind enemy lines right now and passing this word on. And it's a difficult time at this time of year because where a lot of them are, Easter is nothing. And so they, they are bringing a message of hope and truth, a lightness to the darkness, Lord. So we're asking you especially to all of those missionaries, not only the, pe the people that we support individually and as, a, and as a congregation, Lord, but all of those missionaries, Lord. Touch them and anoint them, Lord. Give them strength and give them protection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask you to just give us strength at this time, Lord. In our own personal lens, as, as we may be sacrificing something or such, Lord, or whatever it is, Lord, that's going to bring us a conviction, Lord. Point us to the cross, Lord. Remember that, that the whole purpose of Lent is to point towards the cross. The Old Testament pointed to the New Testament, Lord. Help us, Lord, that in our conviction, there is hope, Lord. But, Lord, we do need to remember that, so help us, Lord. Help us in our own personal convictions every day, Lord that we can see the light. And there's only one place that that light can come from. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. If there's anyone who has any other prayers that they'd like to bring forward at this time, please go ahead and say it.
Lord God, all of these prayers we present to you at your throne, the foot of the cross, and through the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll continue with our Holden Evening Prayer Service. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, so highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child. And his name shall be Jesus, the Chosen One of God Most High. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God, I live to do your will. My soul
mind Whether that nourishes all of creation Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger Peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.